Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of The Banker Next Door. I am your host, Dr. Joe Berquist, and this is our flagship show, our weekly banking update. And I cannot believe it. We've I've actually made it to episode number 100. <laughs> this is uh, pretty pretty amazing. Um, you might notice a little something here. I'm, I'm holding a little something here. I got my little uh, World Wrestling Federation Championship belt. But, oh, that's right. It's, it's, the, it's the WWE now, not the WWF any longer. I'm, I'm dating myself. So, the uh, the reason why I have this is because uh, I was I, it dawned on me this week. I saw an advertisement for WrestleMania, which is coming up in like a week or so, and it's going to be WrestleMania 40. And uh, for, for it was one of those moments where I, I started to, to feel old uh, because I can vividly remember watching WrestleMania three with uh, Hulk Hogan and uh, Andre the Giant, and I you know I kind of went through my phase like so many uh, people of my. Uh, so many fellow Gen Xers that uh, kind of went through, you know, that uh, stage between, I would say, the ages of like six and 12, 13, where, you know, we were just got kind of got all absorbed into uh, into into wrestling, you know, when wrestling was was really coming together as far as uh, being put together on a national stage. And uh, so it, but, it, but it also got me thinking um about banking too because there, there are actually some correlations there so vince mcmahon for for people who don't know vince mcmahon basically he had in his mind a vision uh to create a national wrestling organization uh because in the 70s and even in the early 80s wrestling was a very uh territorial business you had kind of uh big wrestling promotions that dominated certain areas you know southeastern u.s uh northeast uh midwest uh, West Coast, that that kind of thing, and uh, Vince McMahon basically he you know he bought them all up and he turned it into the WWF, which then became the WWE. Um, you know, went through a lot of cycles there, and and banking went through a very similar thing. So in in the 1980s, banks had you didn't have these giant conglomerate national banks uh, like like you know JP Morgan and Bank of America Citibank Wells Fargo like you, those those giant behemoth banks did not exist uh, back in the 80s you know you basically again again banking in a certain respect was also uh, a territorial thing as well you know you had Wells Fargo out on the west coast you had uh, Bank of America here on the east coast you had you know kind of Wells Fargo still uh, as core states and and first union and everything, you know, still down in kind of North Carolina, um, Citibank up in New York. Uh, so, you, you, you know, you had kind of, you know, territorial regions, as it were, with banks as well. And, um, you know, and then you had the interstate banking laws, which basically prevented banks from crossing state lines and just arbitrarily coming in. Um, and then just, you know, building branches and encroaching on other other banks territories, basically. Well, those, those interstate banking laws, they got taken down and that allowed the banks to cross state lines and come across the, the you know, crisscross the entire U.S. and begin to build these more national franchises. Uh, but the, the kind of the big moment, though, came in 1999 because uh, commercial banks and investment banks were still split by something called the Glass-Steagall Act. And in 1999, the Glass-Steagall Act got re got removed. It got repealed. Uh, and that allowed for, you know, basically, the, you know, banks to just come together and for for banks to turn into kind of the behemoths that they that they are today. Um so anyway, so that being said, so I know, so I just I just had that whole kind of uh, wrestling kick because the 40th anniversary of WrestleMania made me feel kind of old. So, um, so anyways, that's what I was opening up with. Uh, so, uh, okay, before we get into all the banking news and everything, and I do have a ton of banking news for everybody today, I just wanted to hit a couple of things real quick for um, different things I'm going to be covering here in the next uh, couple weeks and probably next month or so. So I. I Three books, three interesting books that I've come across here lately that I thought I would share with everybody is the first one. This is called uh, Pirate Money, and this is written by Kevin Friedman. Um, I didn't I really don't know who Kevin is. Apparently, I think Kevin has a, a show uh, on the Blaze uh, Network, which, you know, which I think which obviously I think is probably more famous for like Glenn Beck and a couple of the other personalities. But um, but I don't know. I just I came across this book and it seemed interesting. So the the premise of this movie is basically using gold and silver, putting it in the bank and basically and then getting like a debit card. So, you know, in other words, you open like a checking account, but instead of putting cash 
in the checking account. The checking account's filled with gold and silver. And you use you would have the debit card for this account, and then you would just go and use that wherever you want to shop. You know, Walmart. Um, you know, pump gas. What you know, whatever. Uh, so it was it was a very interesting concept, and apparently they are working on this down in Texas right now. So it, it's just an interesting thing, uh, something I thought I'd take a look at. The next book is called The Great Taking, and this is by David Rogers Webb. And, and this book I came across because of an article that I saw that actually had to do with uh, something called the UCC, the Uniform Commercial Code. And um, every, every state has uh, UCC laws and regulations that go with it. Um, and so I, so basically the premise of this book is that UCC laws have been altered so that in, you know, in other words, as it relates to investment accounts. And ba so basically you have a stock, uh, say uh, you have a, an account at Charles Schwab and you go and you buy stock in that account. The question is like, do you really own that stock? Like, do you really own what you think you own? And the, the apparent changes in certain states to the UCC code could allow somebody like a BlackRock or a State Street or a Vanguard to basically go in and just take the stock or the investments that you think you own, take possession of that through the UCC code. So it's a, kind of a very interesting thing. I'm still doing a lot of research on that. Um, and then I came across this other book called The War on Cash by David McCree. And it's very interesting. I mean, I mean, being a banker, having spent a lot of time in the banking industry, I understand a lot of the things that he, t you know, he talks a lot in here um, about a, just a lot of different things, just kind of encroachment on your personal liberties. He talks about things that banks do in terms of SAR reports, suspicious activity reports and currency transaction reports, the CTRs. So, uh, again, just some very interesting stuff in there. And those were three kind of shorter books shorter reads that I came across that I thought were had kind of interesting topics that I would share with everybody. So, and then the final thing on that is um, I have been a follower for a long time of a gentleman named James Rickards. And he wrote a book, uh, I want to say back in 2010, he wrote a, this book called Currency Wars. And this book was phenomenal. It's a phenomenal read. And it really, it was, he, he has had uh, a very interesting life and a very fanatic, a fascinating background with him. And uh, so he wrote this book and it, and it really took off. It became a hugely popular book back then. He then went and wrote a number of books thereafter. I don't think any of them were quite as good as his first book is Currency Wars. And it, it really is all about economic warfare. And it's and again, it's just it's a fascinating book. And I intended to cover that here in you know, the next uh, probably the next month or so. And then uh, and then James also wrote a book called The New Case for Gold. And uh, this was if uh, that's kind of a little there you go. It's probably a little better angle. Kind of a kind of has a glossy cover on it. But um, but excellent, excellent book on gold. Uh, so when I do, I am planning on doing a couple episodes on gold, not to pitch people on gold, but to do more of the history of gold, a history as a monetary instrument, that kind of thing. Um, you know, again, I mean, if people want to get pitched on gold there, I mean, gosh, there's, there's no endless stream of, uh, you know, people selling gold and gold commercials and all that stuff. I'm not necessarily doing that. So, so anyway, um, so if, if somebody here is, if you're new to the channel, um, I just wanted to say that, you know, you know, the, the banger next door is designed to be a podcast. It's about all things banking. Uh, you know, and I try to touch on pop culture things. I try to look at, you know, business books, uh, business related movies, uh, business related documentaries. If it's things that I, I think are interesting, I try to bring that to people. Uh, we try to do, uh, I try to do a number of interviews with people on different topics, bring that to everybody. Uh, but we also talk just a lot about general banking topics. You know, we talk a lot about economic indicators. We talk about banking regulation that's going on right now. We talk about everyday things, whether it be a particular bank product or a line of business that the bank might do. We, we talk about, you know, things as granular as culture and leadership and um, marketing, advertising, technology, all, all these different, anything, any facet, anything that kind of touches banking. Uh, I try to cover that here at the channel. So, so I hope people will do that. Now, what I typically, again, try to do here with the weekly banking update is I try to just go over the information, try to go over the, the news, the headlines that have come out uh, during the week, try to cover a lot of things, try to talk about what economic indicators came out the last week, what's coming up this week, and really try to just keep people informed as to what's happening right now in the banking world. So 
with that being said, let's get into some of our banking news and stuff that's going on here. So I'm going to start with the economic indicators that are coming out this week. What's coming up this week? Um, so on Monday, uh, we got building permits coming out. We got new home sales. We got the two-year treasury note auction. On Tuesday, we got the durable good orders. Uh, we got CB consumer confidence. We have the five-year treasury note auction, uh, API crude, oil stock. On Wednesday, we get the seven-year treasury note auction. On Thursday, we got GDP, uh, which will be, that'll be pretty interesting. Uh, we got initial jobless claims. Um, what else we got? We got Michigan consumer sentiment. We got pending home sales. And then on Friday, we got the core PCE price index. So obviously some big things coming out this week. If um, you know, if you're hoping for, for interest rate qu uh, cuts from the Fed, obviously GDP is going to be a big thing to look at. The core PCE, which is the Fed's uh, favored inflation index. Uh, we'll see what that looks like. Um, they, you know, you know, inflation has been uh, lifting back up a little bit here over the last couple of months. And we'll see if that trend continues with core PCE next week. So, okay. So before I get into some of the headlines, I just wanted to, I wanted to read you guys something here. So this is coming from uh, Emily McCormick, who is the vice president of editorial and research for bank director. This is kind of her, her weekly little, I call it kind of like a blog post thing that she puts out. So, um, on March 6, the Securities and Exchange Commission issued its final rule to enhance disclosures around climate-related risk. Public companies, including banks, will have to disclose any climate-related risks that could have a material, strategic, operational, or financial impact, and steps taken to mitigate those risks. We'll have to disclose costs or losses associated with severe weather events, and public company boards will have to describe their role in overseeing those risks. Importantly, Public companies will also have to disclose their directly and indirectly created carbon emissions, but the rule won't require companies to disclose emissions created outside its walls by vendors or cl and clients. That's a relief because, you know, I thought this was over the top and was going to create a bunch of ridiculous workforce for a second there. So, OK, so for banks, emissions created by loans and investments, which would be tougher figures to calculate. That's good news for financial firms. Huh? OK, still. Industry groups, including the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, Commerce, quickly cried foul over the SEC's perceived mission creep. In an immediate response to the rule, the Chamber noted concerns about the scope, the breadth, and the legality of the SEC's climate disclosure efforts and didn't rule out litigation. Eric Walsh, who's a uh, counsel at Arnold and Porter, says legal challenges could bear fruit due to the broad national impact of the rule. This is so much more than about disclosures in 10 Ks. Uh, the SEC is effectively implementing an environmental policy with this climate disclosure rule. The SEC rule isn't the first regulatory edict to change how banks examine climate risk. In October of 2023, Federal bank regulators finalized interagency principles targeting banks above 100 billion in assets, basically your larger regional banks. But the SEC rule would have a wider reach impacting smaller public institutions. So in a statement, the SEC chair, Gary Gensler, said the rule aligns with the agency's mandate to protect investors. The SEC has in, an important role in helping to ensure that public companies make full, fair, and truthful disclosures about the material risks they face, he said. Investors get to decide what investments they make upon those disclosures. Uh, lawsuits could come, but Walsh advises public companies to prepare to comply with the rule, which will begin taking effect next year. Uh, I don't think that there's any doubt that the law, that the, uh, the um, lawsuits are going to come uh, because, I mean, this is just a dramatic overstep by the SEC. The SEC is not an environmental organization. Uh, they, you know, they, this is so beyond their bounds. I mean, I mean, they're there to protect people in the sense of, you know, publicly traded companies and securities laws. You know, are people following securities laws? Are they doing things? You know, they're, they're not an environmental company. They're not an environmental organization. They're not there to um, be the an environmental czar, if you will, of the financial world. That, that's not their role. And they're dramatically overstepping their role. And quite frankly, I mean, even, I mean, just a lot of the stuff in here is just ridiculous. You know, I mean, you're, you're going to what they're going to do is they're going to cripple smaller banks with this, you know, and, 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 you know, and you get the typical kind of, um, 
you know, I would say placating where they're like, oh, we're not going to put this on banks under 10 billion. We're just going to get it in place. We're going to make the bigger banks do this, but we're not going to make the little banks do this. And then, and then invariably it always runs down to the little banks It all. It might take a while. It might take an extra year or two, but it always runs down. So, so I, I just wanted to point that out. So the SEC is doing that. I do think there will be lawsuits and I do think eventually uh, that probably will get, you know, repealed or pulled back, but we'll see, see what happens. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about uh, Jeremy Powell. They had the the Federal Reserve had their meeting this week. And let's see. So basically, uh, as of March 20th, so as expected, the FOMC did not change its bench, benchmark rate range from 5.25 to 5.5% for the fifth consecutive meeting. The Fed's updated economic projections maintained 75 basis points of rate cuts in 2024, uh, meaning, they're, meaning they're still looking at three rate cuts, which would be 25 basis points each. However, the 2025 rate cut projections were reduced to 75 basis points from 100 basis points. The median forecast for PCE inflation, the Fed's preferred gauge, uh, remains unchanged at 2.4% for 2024, while core PCE projection was increased to 0.2% to 2.6%. The economic growth estimate for 2024 was increased to 2.1% from 1.4%. Um and then just, you know, the FOMC announced the following actions and analysis. So unanimous policy vote. Uh, the Fed does plan to cut rates, uh, but does does not plan to cut rates until it has gained greater confidence that inflation is moving sustainably toward 2%. Uh, the Fed increased their long-term rate projection to 2.6% from 2.5, which implies long-term rates are slightly higher for longer. And the committee will continue to reduce the balance sheet by 95 billion each month, as previously stated. Um, so, again, and I have said this before, and I will continue saying it: um, inflation is not going back down to two percent. Uh, you do you probably have inflation down to about where it's going to be? Um, Congress yesterday just passed another 1.2 trillion dollar spending bill. And, and I've said this before, until fiscal policy gets under constraint, until we get our deficit back in line and we start to get the national debt crisis under control, you're, you're not going to get inflation under control. They're good. The government is just going to continue to pump money into the economy and that's going to keep the inflation up. It's going to keep the, the uh, inflationary price pressures going. And so the but the Fed is going to have to make a decision here. OK, if the if the if the economy starts to go or if the if the labor market which I believe has already has already taken a major hit, despite the despite the jobs report numbers, which I think are nonsense. Um, you know, they're going to have to make a decision at some point. Either the jobs numbers and the GDP, either they're real, and the economy is really strong, or they're or they're not. They're just a fabrication, and therefore the Fed decides that they're going to need to cut rates. My guess is sooner or later they're going to start putting out the real numbers. They're going to start to put out there because other, otherwise the Fed would not have any excuse to ever cut the rate because they're because of, why would you if the, if the if the labor market is strong and the economy is strong you know GDP is humming along and the unemployment rate remains at all time lows uh, and your inflation is still over three percent like you there there's no reason at that point for the Fed to cut the rates but we all know that the the labor market is not that strong that the economy is not that strong um, and so in order to get things going again, they're probably going to have to cut rates. And furthermore, they're going to have a debt. Uh, they're going to have a big debt impact on banks sooner rather than later. It's coming. Like basically you're, you've got uh, commercial real estate that's going to need to be refinanced. You got uh, private equity deals, leverage buyout type deals, mezzanine deals, all these, uh, you know, the, and that's not to even discuss the national debt, uh, which is going to have to be rolled over and refinanced at, at some point here at much higher interest rates. So, um, you know, so the Fed is really on this crazy, trying to balance this crazy seesaw right now. And um, and I wonder just like how much longer this is going on. And, that, and that's not even to mention, we still, we didn't even mention the inverted yield curve and about how long the yield curve has been inverted. So, yeah, so stay tuned on that anyway. Okay, let's get into some banking news right here. So um, antitrust came out as the bone of contention when Capital One Financial Corp with federal regulators, um, its application to acquire fellow major credit card issuer, Discover Financial Services. Um, so 
In its filed application, Capital One said the merger would be good for financial stability. It would not harm competition as the combined entity would have just about 13% credit card purchasing volume, Reuters reported. After the filing, a coalition of 30 organizations against the deal asked federal regulators to extend the public comment period, host public hearings, and for the U.S. Justice Department to apply its 2023 guidelines on mergers. So if you go back to the episode that I did on this, um, you know, the, again, uh, Capital One was hoping for the kind of like this really fast closing period, which I thought was just just, you know, no way that was going to no way that was going to come to fruition. So, you know, there and, and again, now you're you're now starting to see this substantial uh, pushback on this deal. So, we'll, you know, so we'll, we'll have to continue to keep an eye on to see what's going to happen there. So. Uh, U.S. federal regulatory agencies are extending the applica applicability, applicability, applicability date of certain provisions in the October 23 Community Reinvestment Act rule from April 1st, 2024 to January 1st, 2026. The agency said in a press release that the extension aligns the facility-based assessment areas and public file provisions with other parts of the 2023 CRA final rule that are applicable on January 1st, 2026. As such, banks need not make changes to their assessment area or public files until January 1st, 2026. Um, Shuttered Cryptocurrency Exchange, FTX, expects the U.S. government to reduce its claims to $3 billion, uh, $2, $3 billion, to five, or to $3 billion from $5 billion, with no money left for shareholders, uh, Reuters reporting, citing court filings in response to FTX founder Sam Bankman-Fried claims that he should get a light prison sentence since FTX can pay back its customers in full. Um, well, I, maybe. We'll, we'll see what happens there. So U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen said she would welcome legislation that would settle the conflict between federal and state laws on the sale and use of marijuana that prevents cannabis firms from assessing banking services, Reuters reported, citing Yellen's remarks at a U.S. House subcommittee hearing. Okay, so the FDIC proposed updated guidance on bank mergers. So the FDIC proposed revisions to its statement of policy or SOP on bank merger transactions incorporating uh, some of what are where the ICBA advocated provisions. So the uh, the revisions are designed to re reflect legislation and other developments that have occurred since the SOB was last amended in 2008. The revised SOP describes the types of applications subject to FDIC approval, addresses each statutory factor, and highlights relevant matters and considerations, such as related statutes pertaining to interstate mergers. Um so, and then, for instance, like mergers resulting in institutions over 100 billion in assets, which ICBA flagged in its comment letter, should be subject to heightened scrutiny, but should not be presumed to be anti-competitive so long as the bank has a traditional community bank business model. So, again, their FDIC is kind of making more more um, changes to this. I think they're also feeling some pressure from people. Again, if you if you go back and look at some of the episodes I've done on mergers and acquisitions, you'll see that part of the issue there is the time, the time frame it takes to get a merger deal done and how regulators are, are holding these deals up and they're taking it much, making it much longer for these deals to get completed on time. So we'll have to see what's going on there. Okay. So existing home sales surge in February. So existing home sales rose 9.5% in February, the largest monthly increase since February of 2023, though sales were down 3.3% from a year ago, according to the National Association of Realtors. Uh, the median sales price increased 5.7% from February of 2023, the eighth consecutive month of year over year price gains. Obviously, the lack of inventory out there continuing to, to drive prices. Um, but it is it is good to see that existing home sales rose. Uh, and then let's see here. Rural Economic Index was the lowest since June of 2020. So Creighton University's Index of Rural Economic Conditions declined this month to its lowest level since June of 2020. The Laurel Main Street Index decreased to 38 from 46.2 uh, in January or in February on higher interest rates, weaker agricultural commodity prices, and higher grain storage costs. Here's kind of an interesting story. Crypto hacks fuel North Korean income report. So cryptocurrency hacks account for half of North Korea's foreign income since 2017. Uh, so the UN believes North Korea has stolen at least $3 billion 
since 2017. North Korea funds 40% of its weapons of mass destruction programs with stolen crypto. And the Security Council is investigating 17 crypto hacks last year worth $750 million attributed to North Korean agents. Um, okay, this I thought was interesting. Um, I did an episode last week on, uh, I have like, a, I run like a crypto series and I did part seven. And part of that was about BlackRock and how the, uh, they've done this 180 on crypto. And now BlackRock's like in love with all things crypto. So BlackRock launched its first tokenized fund issued on a public blockchain, which will provide qualified investors the opportunity to earn U.S. dollar yields by subscription through Securitized Markets, LLC. The BlackRock USD Institutional Digital Liquidity Fund invest 100% of its total assets in cash, U.S. Treasury bills, and repurchase agreements, uh, repo contracts, uh, allowing investors to earn yield while holding the token on the blockchain. Anchorage Digital Bank, BitGo, Coinbase Global, and Fireblocks are some of the first participants in the ecosystem. BlackRock also announced a strategic investment in securitized markets. So if you don't think that BlackRock is doing all that, with the idea that there is going to be a central bank digital currency, you're fooling yourself. That is exactly why they're doing this. They're doing this because they are, this is all in preparation for a central bank digital currency. I've got more, more to follow on that. So um, let's see what else we got here. Um, uh, skip that stuff. Uh, so, Okay, small businesses, again, most satisfied with community banks as per a Federal Reserve study. Small business borrowers approved for at least uh, approved for at least some of the financing they sought last year were, again, more satisfied with their experiences at community banks than at larger and online lenders, according to the Federal Reserve. So according to the Federal Reserve's latest small business credit survey, 79% of community bank loan applicants were satisfied with their experience compared with 61% at large banks and 56% at finance companies and 40% at online lenders. Community banks net satisfaction score of 74% topped large banks by 21 points, finance companies by 32 points, and online lenders by 59 points. Community bank applicants were the least likely to report challenges with interest rates or repayment terms and the repayment terms and the most likely to say they experienced no challenges. So just a thought on that. Um, and I'm going to actually get that small business credit survey because I review I review that pretty much every year. And I'm going to take a look at that and see if there's anything new on the horizon there with that. Um, just a thought on that. So why would online lenders only have a 40% score? Um, in other words, if I go to OnDeck or Bluevine or Cabbage or one of these one of these online lenders, maybe even even PayPal and Amazon. Um, I could load up my tax returns, put in a bunch of information, probably get approved at 15 minutes, maybe an hour at the most. And then, you know, I could have money in my bank account within probably 24 to 48 hours. So, I mean, and people seem to be very satisfied with the ease and the speed with which they can get loans online. The problem is it's that 70, it's that, that darn 75% interest rate. And the fact that that loan has to be paid back within 12 months and they, the online lenders hit your bank account every week with uh, payments. It could be, you know, depending on how much you borrow, it could be two, three, four thousand dollars a week. Um, that's why their score is 40%, because I think a lot of people get into it without fully understanding what they're about to get into. And then they get, they get nailed. And then they're, they're like, oh my gosh, like this is not what I signed up for. So just something to think about there. And again, I'll talk about that more in depth another time. Uh, let's see here. Yep. Fed holds rates steady. Um, uh, do, 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 do. ICBA uh, backs bill to bar SBA 7A direct lending. So ICBA expressed strong support for legislation that would prohibit the Small Business Administration from making direct loans under the 7A program. So introduced by Senate Banking Committee ranking member Tim Scott, the Protecting Access to Credit for Small Business Act targets a provision from President Joe Biden's fiscal 2025 budget proposal to authorize 7A direct lending. Um, Yes, I, I would definitely agree with this. Uh, I, I, you know, I don't think, you know, SBA has been doing a lot of things lately. One of the things that they did was they opened up the 
this, they, they kind of opened up a lot of their programs so that under other lenders, a lot of like, say like online lenders, different people could come in to the program for the first time and start making SBA loans. Now on the surface, that might seem like a great thing. And it's kind of, it, it take too long for me to explain all the nuance to it here now, but I would just say that, you know, SBA lending is a very niched nuanced lending. And the SBA, they change the rules so much and so often, and sometimes to such a major magnitude with some of the things that they put through that it, it is very difficult, even for highly experienced bank lenders that have been making SBA loans for 40 years and you know have, have a whole team of highly experienced people that have been doing it for a long time and know all the ins and outs. It's challenging even for them to keep up with a lot of the things that happen, let alone somebody who's basically just coming into it for the first time that doesn't really know the, the ins and outs of the program, uh, doesn't you know really know the, the the SOP and all that kind of stuff. So, but but anyway, so we'll, we'll go on that. But but yes, I I don't think the SBA should be making loans directly themselves. Uh, but, but again, we'll go on to so. Um, okay, let's keep going here and see what else. I wanted to get to some of the other. Um, okay, housing starts, building permits rise. So housing starts increased 10.7% in February and we're up 5.9% from a year ago with single family starts rising 11.6% from January. The Commerce Department reported uh, building permits rose 1.9% month to month and we're up 2.4% from the same time last year. Um, oh, uh, the Bank of Japan ended eight years of negative interest rates and loosened most of its unorthodox monetary easing policies in a historic shift. As part of the decision, the central bank said it will move its key target for short-term rates to a range of 0% to 0.1%, its first rate increase since 2007, and scrap its so-called yield curve controls, adding that it expects to maintain accommodative financial conditions for the time being the Wall Street Journal reported. And I actually just did an episode, which I posted this weekend, all about this. So if you're if you're interested in getting a little bit more information on that, a little bit more in depth, uh, go check that out. So a um, couple more things here. Around 30% of U.S. bank leaders have banned the use of, artif of generative artificial intelligence tools within their companies due to concerns such as false information, job losses, diminishing skills, and human interaction, among others, the American banker reported, citing a study by its publisher, Arizant. Uh, two investments firms, Tokyo-based Delphi and San Francisco-based Global Predictions, Inc., agreed to pay 400000 in civil penalties to settle SEC charges of allegedly making false and misleading statements about the purported use of artificial intelligence. So a couple of very interesting article, article artificial intelligence articles there. Um, you know, 30% of bank leaders have banned the use of generative artificial intelligence tools, um, you know, which is just very interesting. And we're going to have to continue to keep a close eye on that. And then obviously these two investment firms having to pay a civil penalty because of making false and misleading statements about the, how they're using artificial intelligence. That's, that's interesting because you got to start to think maybe there's a lot of other firms out there doing the same kind of thing. So, um, okay. Um, Chicago-based investment bank M1 Finance LLC was fined $850,000 by the Financial Industry uh, Regulatory Authority for alleged violations regarding its use of social media influencer program. The regulator alleged that the social media posts made by influencers on the firm's behalf were not fair or balanced or contained exaggerated, unwarranted, un, uh, promise, promissory or misleading claims. So... Um, yeah, be careful about the social media users you use. <laughs> um, okay, do we have any? Uh, that's what we've got we here. Do we have anything else? Um, uh, all right, I think that's I think that's good for right now. I just I just want to hit some. Headlines real quick. I know I'm kind of running a little long here this week, but uh, but I like I said, I was kind of kicking off here. It's the hundredth episode, you know. I gotta gotta yeah, I gotta get you guys in. Gotta get all the information to you guys. So, uh, okay, Fed likely to trim rate cut projections as inflation labor markets stay hot. Uh, let's see here, Nash. Uh, let's see here, Feds 
bailout program is ending. Bank reserves are getting a closer look. So basically the bed, the bed, the federal reserve ended the bank term funding program on March 11th. Um, and they basically still have about 165 billion in balances out on that, but those will all be probably paid off over the next year or so. Um, so now they're, you know, they're starting to take a, a harder look at banks, you know, liquidity positions and, and what are banks doing uh, in terms of managing that liquidity strategically. So uh, U.S. banks mortgage origination fee income rise in the fourth quarter of 2023 as pressures ease. Consumer checkup inflation interest rates threaten spending as confidence lags. Yes. If you go back and look at some of the episodes that I did on, on inflation, on credit card debt. Uh, yeah, you could see that, yeah, and, and fl the inflation, price inflation is just killing consumers. And you could see that, you know, credit card debt is at an all-time high. Um, buy now, pay later is that, is, is the, you know, the use of buy now, pay later has shot up. And that's because, you know, people, all the COVID funds are gone. People have tapped out their credit cards. Uh, they're you. They they're using the buy now, pay later, and the inflation is just it's killing them. It's absolutely killing them. Um, U.S. retail sales uh, bounced back in February. Uh, February retail sales rebounded from a lower January reading as consumers spent more on home improvements, cars, and electronics. And again, I say to you, did they really spend more, or do things just cost more and they have to spend more money? to, you know, buy less product, you know, so just, again, things to, things to ponder there, things that make you go, hmm. So, okay, challenges in multifamily are real, especially in the Sun Belt. So people are starting to notice some cracks in the multifamily market. Uh, another consumer checkup, U.S. bank auto loan delinquencies reach a decade-long high in 2023. So U.S. bank's auto loan delinquency ratio reached its highest level of any year in the last decade during 2023, even as wage growth and unemployment signaled overall consumer health. So the auto loan uh, delinquency ratio at U.S. banks stood at 3.32% at the end of last year, marking the highest ratio for the industry since at least 2013. According to S&P Global Market Intelligence, the increase came even as the industry's auto total auto loans declined to $530 billion from $548 billion in 2022, the first year-over-year year year drop since at least 2013. So again, people are getting killed on auto loans. They're getting killed on uh, cars because cars are not cheap anymore. Um, consumer checkup. Banks have edge in buy now, pay later. So banks are poised to challenge uh, pure play providers in the growing buy now, pay later market, helped by favorable regulation trends and natural advantages such as large balance sheets, which they can lend. Um, buy now, pay later, which lets consumers pay for purchases in a series of interest-free installments boom during the COVID-19 pandemic as online shopping surged amid lockdowns and the market has been expanding ever since because people are getting tapped out. Uh, as a banker, uh, I would not that would not generally be a line of business I would want to get into, but I'll, I'll have to explain that. I'll save that into another another episode. Um, card lenders look for more growth despite delinquency spikes. So lend, uh, lenders and investors are signaling confidence in borrowers' ability to manage their credit card debts <laughs> despite delinquencies that have jumped past pre-pandemic levels. Uh, yeah, that's uh, some wishful thinking right there. So uh, formal Federal Reserve Bank regulators bash Basel III and call for a re-proposal. So um, former Fed governor and vice chair for supervision, Randy Quarles, thinks it will be impossible for the agencies to address all the concerns without scrapping the current proposal and starting from scratch. Uh, Quarles believes there will be a significant down calibration of Basel in its final form. However, the former regulator believes a reproposal -pro re should happen. Um, also, uh, let's see here. Uh, I, oh, I, I don't think it's possible to change the original proposal enough to put it in line with what was expected by Basel and what's required by circumstances without the law requiring it to be repurposed. Speaking on the same panel, Former FDIC Chairman uh, Jelena McWilliams also brought up the Administrative Procedure Act, saying she hopes agencies do not uh, that agencies do not follow it and get sued. <laughs> Spicy. 
Um, I hope you get sued and I hope you lose, McWilliams said, answering a question about agency oversight uh, posed by the moderator. The reason is that when you promulgate rules that basically either don't follow this practice and I just outlined uh, or don't follow the Administrative Procedure Act, as Randy just spoke to, and the internal checks and balances fail for you to produce a rule that's reasonable, then you only have two outcomes left, judicial and congressional. So, yeah, interesting things there happening there. Um, wholesale borrowing steadies, even as banks defend cash cushions. So uh, wholesale borrowing, in other words, line of credits with the Federal Home Loan Bank, still staying stable there. Um, average credit card net loss rates inches closer to pre-pandemic highs as credit card delinquency continues to go. Um, uh, bank regulator, federal home loan bank collaboration key to keeping home loan borrowing intact. Credit union bank deals becoming bigger part of M&A landscape. Uh, large M&A deals come to market defying regulatory headwinds. Yeah, there's been a few. Um, and then we already talked about that. Okay. So that's kind of it for this week. Uh, basically, I'm going to wrap up. I'm going to say, uh, so I did a number of episodes this weekend. If, you're, if you've been following the Lords of Easy Money series that I've been doing, I'm basically reviewing every chapter of that book. Uh, I just put, I posted episode seven, which, which, which was a review of chapter six, which covers the first part of the book. And there's, there's three parts. Uh, each part, I think, has six chapters. So we got through part one. And now we're really starting to get into the, the meat of the book. So if you want to understand the economy, if you want to understand what's going on right now, you have to read that book, period, end of story. You got to read that book. You got to understand that book. And if you can, then you're, you are going to understand all this stuff that's going on. You're going to understand exactly why the Federal Reserve has done a horrible job. You're going to understand why they have put this country in such a pickle with uh trying to figure out they, they you know they put us in this crazy seesaw situation uh but check out that series uh I, I again i hope that people are really enjoying that um and i put up some other episodes this week where i talked about you know obviously the the japanese ending the era of negative interest rates um i put up another uh just i reviewed uh bank directors 2024 uh, risk survey which is always a great survey to look at kind of you know what risks uh do bankers see right now what do they see on the horizon for the rest of 2024 um what else did what else did we do we did um uh i'm trying to think uh so we get yeah did that did that oh and i did a huge episode on realtors uh right now nar the national association of realtors they just settled a massive lawsuit that is most likely going to have ram major ramifications on the just the sale the real estate sales process in residential real estate because it directly affects the commissions particularly the buyer agent commissions and how that whole thing is going to function, how it's all going to play out. So, uh, and those new rules are not supposed to kick in until July of this year, but there's a lot of things that have to happen first. You know, a judge has got to approve the settlement. Uh, then the DOJ could potentially get involved. Uh, then, you know, the, the lawyers have to set up this fund. They have to create a process for you to be able to apply if you think that you're, you're owed money out of this thing. There's probably going to be millions and millions of, of families and people that are going to be that are be trying to get you know some of the money out of this fund. So uh, a lot of things to come. But but what happens? How does this affect the real estate settlement process at the end of the day? What kind of costs will this add to buyers? You know, what kind of potential savings will sellers get in this whole thing? How will this affect banks and their the, how they finance the home purchase transaction? So just a, a lot of things there. To, to contemplate a lot of things to, to think about there, but definitely check out that episode. Uh, because again, if you, if you work in the residential real estate in any way, shape or form, you definitely want to go check that, that episode out. Uh, and, and, you know, if you're thinking about buying a house this year, you definitely want to go check that episode out. So, but, uh, but that's all I got for everybody this week. I just, I really want to thank all the subscribers and people that have come on this journey with me so far. I mean, it's only been seven months and it's, uh, it, it just, it, but it, it feels longer than that, but it's been a short period of time, but getting to, to a hundred episodes, uh, has been a fantastic journey and, uh, I hope everybody's enjoying the show and I hope you'll continue to, to stick along with me here. So, but if everybody, 
everybody, if you like this episode, please make sure to like, share, subscribe. That always helps the channel. Please make sure to leave your comments below. I always love getting back to people. I always love hearing people's thoughts on all these, these various topics and things that go on here. And please make sure to check us out on YouTube, Rumble, and all major podcast platforms. Make sure to go to thebankernextdoor.com and check out the website. And with that, oh, and uh, very important, I'm kind of taking off next week as the good uh, Catholic boy that I am. I am not uh, going to be doing much on Easter weekend. I am putting together an Easter special episode. It'll just be one episode that'll that'll be released uh, next weekend, probably probably on Saturday. I'll release that. Uh, but that's all I got for next weekend. I'm kind of taking you know a week or so off here, and then I'll be back the following week with with more episodes. So I hope everybody uh, for those celebrating Easter, I wish you a happy Easter, and I hope everybody has a great Holy Week. And, uh, and then uh, for every, everybody else, I hope you just have a great week out there. And I will talk to everybody again real soon. Thanks a lot. And thanks for uh, just thanks for being here at the channel. I appreciate it.